Welcome to Secrets from the Scene, a show for local musicians who want to improve their music, grow their audience, and learn about Minnesota's music scene. If you're interested in talking about all things music related and meeting interesting people from our local community, you're in the right place. You know, it's taken us years to even have this conversation. Oh, yeah. And it's probably not 100% accurate, and it's probably not 100% complete. <laughs> no, definitely not 100% complete. I think I said already, I mean, if we cover 80% of it, you're welcome, listeners, because it took me 10 years to get this 80% of it. There's a lot to know. We don't have any vested interest in trying to persuade you to any model. We've tried them all. Yeah. We've had successes and failures. But when you research sync you're going to find a lot of companies out there defining sync in a way that is self-serving they will often make kind of ethical morally self-righteous claims about why their model is the best and why they're artist friendly and just vilify everybody else and we've made money through almost every model and we've also you know had some failures through almost every model you know this gets said it's about every industry it's probably cliche but it's really about the people and the network and kind of their character and, and their business. Welcome to Secrets from the Scene. My name is Steven Helvig and I'm your host. I'm a local producer here in the Twin Cities. We're at my studio, Helvig Productions, out near Excelsior, Minnesota. And today we're gonna to talk about sync licensing. This is an episode I've been wanting to do since really the start of the podcast. I wanna talk a lot about sync because it's a, a question I get asked a lot from artists, both the people that I work with and just others that I meet in the industry. It's a hard topic to sort of wrap up into one conversation because it's, it's quite varied throughout the sync industry. As I started to put this plan together, I realized that I really couldn't do it alone. And so I've asked my good friend, Dan Ludke, to help me do this. Dan is also a music producer, a guitarist, and a composer. Dan's been writing music for sync for many years now and was actually the person that sort of introduced me to that side of the world. I knew what it was, but I wasn't actively writing for sync music or getting any placements until I met Dan. Dan graciously showed me the ropes, and over the years, we've done a lot of music together. We've had a lot of uh, success across lots of different TV shows, lots of different ads, lots of different brands, and ultimately, we've worked with a lot of different sync companies. By doing that, we've certainly been through the ropes of being confused plenty of times as one is, as they try to figure out sync, but we've learned a lot. So I'm really grateful to Dan to, to come on today and help fill in the blanks, help correct me when I misspeak. But yeah, please welcome Dan Ludke. Hey, it's good to be here. I'll, I'll try to help mitigate confusion <laughs> rather than increase it. But you're right, it's a complicated topic. Ultimately, the goal for this episode is to be a primer, not to fully cover everything, because I think that'll happen over multiple episodes. But to be a primer of what the sync industry is, my goal for today is to try to break down some of the major differences in how sync companies work, how they're structured, how their models are different, who they serve in terms of their clients, and who they work with in terms of artists and composers, because there's a lot of variety there. If you can see the big picture of how the sync industry works, what the market is looking for and how we fill those gaps, it can help to understand where you might fit into it if you're interested in getting into the sync industry. After that, there's a ton to learn, like how to write for it, what makes for good sync, how to negotiate deals, or really not so much negotiate deals, but how to know when a deal is good or not when it's offered to you, because there's generally not a lot of negotiation room for for some of these deals. Where do you go to learn more? All of those things we're going to touch on briefly, but I think we're going to save that for other episodes too. So the goal is to kind of give a, a big picture of what the sync industry is and why it's set up that way, and hopefully allow you to sort of frame where you might fit inside of it. Does that seem like a fair assessment of our intentions? <laughs> I think so, yeah. We obviously can't cover everything. It's a big topic. There's a lot of different companies out there. And yeah, I think if, if we can give a, an overview and, and how people might fit into it, maybe discuss whether they want to try to fit into it. It's not right for everybody. 
but a, a lot of musicians have heard of sync right everybody yes and but a lot of them haven't done anything in it and they think it's like this thing on the back burner for them right like i've got to get into that i've got to figure out sync there's money to be made there but it's an intimidating topic right yeah i mean it's because there's so much to know there's so many companies there's so many deals just understanding the rights and the splits and how you collect revenue so hopefully we can just shed some light on some of that absolutely all right well let's start with the absolute basic 101 what is sync what is a sync yeah what is a sync well sync is short for synchronization and a sync is a synchronization license that means somebody paid for a license to put music with their picture. Picture being a video, like an ad, could be a social media video. Sometimes the term is used and it's not even a visual. It could be like a podcast theme song or a radio advertisement. But that's sync. Somebody is paying for music to put to put to to some their, kind of media. Yeah, their content. Yeah, their content. Yeah. There's, as Dan alluded to, lots of different types of sync. Obviously, there's music in the background of TV or in film. There's advertisements. There's podcasts. There's YouTube videos. There's social media content. So it, it exists everywhere, and it's a growing thing, which is why it, it gets a lot of attention. But they all pay differently. And they all work slightly differently. And there's a lot of different companies that serve different sides of this market. You will hear the word sync license and you will hear the word master use license when it comes to this sort of thing and it's partially because there are two copyrights when it comes to music it's important to understand this in the sync world too there is the song or composition and that has its own copyright and then there's the sound recording the master and that has its own copyright now for indie artists a lot of times they own both you know if you're a singer songwriter one person band kind of thing you own both sides of that there are scenarios with record labels where you don't own your masters. They own the masters or a portion of the masters. And if you have a publishing deal with somebody, you may not own all of your own musical composition. A big part of the industry is getting things cleared perfectly. And by cleared, it just means having the rights to use it, being able to secure this license. The sync license is often covering the, the composition side, and then the master use license is technically covering the master side. But in all the cases for indie artists where there is one person representing both sides, both copyrights, it can just be called a sync license and or an all in license and things like that. So that's the first part of the confusion is just even understanding that lingo. But if somebody's going to use your music to a piece of content, they need a license for it. Because that's the case, and because it can be hard to clear these licenses of all the owners of a song, of a particular song, Companies exist to make this easier. And we're going to talk about different categories of sync companies. Every one of these categories can overlap with another category. And you will see companies that squarely fit into every single version of it. They have different offerings across their company to serve each one of these categories that I'm, I'm sort of making these up because I think it kind of helps to organize the conversation a little bit. But let's start at the top with sort of the largest sync companies. Let's start with production music libraries. Do you want to start by describing what a production okay. music library yeah, is? Yeah, I'll try to explain what a production music library is. It's a library of music that is organized by genre, mood, BPM, uh, beats per minute, you name it. And it's available to be licensed by people who need music for their projects. Probably the most crucial component of a production music library is that the music is pre-cleared. That means the client, the person perusing the production music library, can secure a license just by purchasing it from the production music library. They don't, nobody has to go to the drummer and the guitarist and the songwriter. That would be too time consuming. That, and that's why these, these came to be, to make it convenient for the end user. So that's, that's a production music library. There's many different ones, but I'd say the, the unifying feature is that it's a library, it's organized, just like a library of books, and that the music is pre-cleared. Yeah. These libraries are generally very large. A big part of their business model is having a very user-friendly searchable database 
where they take tons of time doing metadata, meaning this is the key of the song, this is the BPM, this is the mood. If it's got lyrics, this is what the lyrics are about. These are the common uses it might have. I mean, they, they will spend a lot of time doing metadata so that if somebody is in the library searching for a piece of music, they find what they're looking for. You might think that it, that it would be fairly easy to, to just, yeah, I need this kind of music. But if you ever do this for yourself, and if you are in sync, this is a good thing to try. You can go on these library sites and try to find a piece of music for a random commercial or something like that, or a random TV scene, and you might realize how hard it is to find the right one. And so these libraries are trying to serve those clients. Now let's talk about the library's clients. They're often serving large networks, you know, people that need a lot of music all the time, you know, music supervisors for specific shows, networks, editors for smaller shows that are just doing all of that placement themselves. A particular show sometimes might have 20 to 30 pieces of music underneath the whole way through. At least. And then there's, if you think about all the different types of TV shows, there's stuff that is using songs, some stuff that's using just instrumentals, some things that are doing more mood music or tension or things that aren't really structured like a song. They're, they're more highlighting a scene, kind of like a soundtrack, but not really yet, not custom. So, you know, TV networks and film studios, who else would be client, typical clients of a production music library? Oh, I think you named a lot of the most common ones, ad agencies. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. TV shows, documentaries, films, you name it. I would encourage listeners to start paying more attention to music in the background of whatever media they watch. It's, it's often there all the time. Kind of pay attention to how it's being used. A lot of it is production music, meaning it was not composed specifically for that film or, or scene. It was pulled from a library and an editor or a music supervisor paired it with that scene. Okay. Other things to know about production music libraries are that they're largely exclusive libraries and they are largely going to procure placements that have royalty on the back end through your performing rights organization. All right, let's kind of talk about how that works. Now, again, I said this at the beginning, but there are exceptions and overlap to everything, so you will find differences. So we're going to just talk about commonalities of each one of these categories. In a large production music library, you and I say write a, an album of music that is tension music. And uh, there's a library that needs more tension music for crime shows. And so they will s sign it over exclusively. Now, that will often look like we own the master now, the company owns the master now forever, and we have full control of it. And then we're going to split the publishing royalties on the background. They're going to take the publishing half and we're going to keep our writer's share. And we maybe get some upfront money for signing with that library. Maybe, maybe not. And then if it gets placed in a TV show, where we're going to make money is on the royalties through our performing rights organization. Yes, that is probably the most common production music deal. Yes. Exclusive 50-50. Yeah. And right away, a lot of artists will go, that's a terrible deal. I don't, I don't control my own songs. So one of the things you have to understand about production music libraries in the sync world is that they're often not working with artists. They're working with composers. Yes. And there's a difference there. Again, there's overlap, but there is a difference. People that are writing for production music libraries are often self-described as composers and because they are writing a collection of music with the sole intent of getting it placed in one of these libraries because they know that these libraries are very large some of them are global you know huge huge distribution reach that their music can be used in media in so many different forms of media for many many years and then those royalties just trickle in for a long long time you have a lot of music in production music libraries Yes. Yeah, I do. We do together. Yeah. Yeah. 50-50 exclusive deals are the most common in production music libraries. And in perpetuity, meaning forever, is also very common. And yes, usually production music libraries are full of music by composers, more so than artists, although that's not a strict rule. Often 
production music libraries will have an artist label or something like that, which often means that it's an artist who performs and releases music, you know, maybe on Spotify. It's, it's often not a very clean line between composers and artists when right. it comes to production music, right? But the libraries will sometimes position it that way because maybe their clients, it's easier for them to push artist music to their clients who don't just want composers or they don't want library music, they want artist music. Yeah. This is a great way to sum this up is that one of the other common ways that these libraries, one of the common labels these libraries get is stock music libraries, <laughs> because that can be the stigma, right? Of that, this is just stock music. It's not very good. Yeah. It's formulaic. It's mass produced. Right. Right. Which is to some extent true. However, however, if you're in that industry, you know that while that does exist, there's also a plethora of music in those libraries that's incredibly good. Very, very high end stuff. Very good. It's competitive. Yeah. Both things exist. And in fact, as it's gotten flooded since COVID with even more people writing for sync, I would say that quality level just keeps going up and up and up in, in these libraries. So I think it's pretty unfair to call, let's just flat out call a library like that stock music. I think it's a little um, biased or ignorant of the actual situation, but it devalues it. Right? Yeah. But that's, but that's how these things work. Now they will, like Dan said, sometimes have a branch specifically because if the client, if their client thinks of it as stock music, then just literally saying, well, these are artists that wrote it might make them think that it sounds better. Yeah, and the library might be able to charge more for yeah, that track. Correct. And a lot of times, I, I know this from my conversations with publishers and sync agents, a client will say they want artist music, but I think really they like the idea of artist music, right? Like it's a real band, it's real musicians. And that that's great. But at the end of the day, and this kind of gets back to your point about you know, try pairing music to an ad. Try getting the, finding the perfect piece of music for an ad. You know, just turn the sound down and put music behind it. At the end of the day, they want functional music. They want something with the right mood for their scene that helps them tell their story, that makes people feel a certain way, right? And whether or not that's artist music or composer music, I think doesn't matter. Yeah, and I think the line between what makes you a composer versus what makes you an artist is a little bit silly too. Generally, that line in people's minds is, are you playing shows and promoting your stuff? Do you have music out on Spotify and that sort of thing? It's for that reason, there are composers that literally make a specific artist name and put their music on Spotify just to front as being an artist, even though they have no interest in really pursuing the artist journey. Right. They're just making music that's good for sync, but they know if they can position themselves as looking like legitimate artists, it will be worth more yeah. to the end client and to the, to the middleman and in, in between. To the, certain end clients, especially ad clients who maybe want to pair their product with an artist that has a fan that. base and a, and cultural relevancy or, or kind of like a high end film spot or. Yes. Things okay. like that. We're, we're getting ahead of ourselves though. And that's yeah. a whole nother conversation. We're going to get to that soon because in general, the production music libraries aren't doing that. The bulk of their work is largely instrumental. It's lar it's pre-cleared. It's in a library and it's easy to get and easy to use on bulk. So yes. tons of shows are pulling from this. Let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons. If you're, let's say a singer songwriter, right? You, you compose your own music. And you're thinking, I want to get into sync. You've got some music out, but you also could maybe see yourself being a composer in that sense. And you want to write some stuff. The pros and cons of production music libraries. The first thing that comes to mind for me is that, well, it's exclusive. So if you sign it over to them and it doesn't get a placement, it's just gone. Yeah. You, you, if it's in perpetuity. Yeah. If it's in and perpetuity. And in some ways, even if it's not in perpetuity, it could be viewed as damaged goods to future potential clients. Yeah. And the upside though, however, is that generally speaking, there's more placements to be had because these production music libraries tend to have a wider reach. Yeah. Because they're exclusive and they're more convenient for the client. I think it's important to remember that the, the clients are kind of driving the market. That's why there's all these models and certain clients, they want a 
huge library of music that's pre-cleared. A lot of them, like major networks, you know, ABC, NBC, they just want to pay a single license fee, a blanket license fee for the year and have access to all those tracks just at their fingertips. They just give them to the editors. Okay, crime TV show, here you go. Here's all the crime tension albums in our library. Could be hundreds of them because that's convenient to a, a TV network that has multiple crime TV shows that are in production constantly. Yeah. They're putting out so much media that you think about all the new stuff that comes out on Netflix, Netflix alone, but then you stretch that across every network and every production company. And then there's a massive need for content. And a lot of it does not need to be some trending artist. It just needs to work for the scene. And that's what these production music libraries are largely filling. They're filling that need. Yes. That's their specialty is highly functional music. For yeah. Television, you know. I say television, but it could be any kind of... Because television is probably the most used area of the content. Yes. Yeah. Definitely applies to streaming shows. Okay. We should mention just a few examples of big production music libraries. So all the majors have production music libraries, pretty much, right? There's yeah, yeah. BMG, Universal. Universal, BMG, Warner Chapel, Extreme Music, Five Alarm. Covered a lot of the West big ones One. right there. West One. Yeah. yeah. These are huge production music libraries and coveted. If you get into one of these places with that 50-50 deal, you're likely going to get a lot of music placements. Yes, they have huge distribution networks and they serve, you know, all the major outlets. Yeah. Now, let's actually, before we move on, man, this conversation is going to get long. I already know it. Yeah, but before, I had one more point I wanted yeah. to say too on it. You go uh, ahead really. first. Well, you were talking about the 50-50 exclusive deal and how like that is like people's alarms are going off when they hear that, like, oh, that's a terrible deal. So a lot of people get offered that deal and then they'll give that contract to their attorney and say, hey, can you look at this? And a lot of attorneys will say, this is a terrible deal. Why would you do this? Even music attorneys, because they maybe don't understand the production music lens, where actually a 50-50 exclusive deal with one of these major companies could be quite lucrative. I mean, you and I, one of our most lucrative outlets was one of those companies. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to say that, that it might look bad in the artist world, but in the production music world, that's very common and can be much better exactly. than the alternatives. And I want to stop to make these points as often as we can, because that's the goal of this episode is to frame why these companies exist and that there are good reasons for all of them. There's a good reason to want to write for every single version of the companies we're going to talk about. They can all be lucrative. However, if it's mismatched with who you are and what your musical output is, then it might be a really bad deal, Yeah. right? Or if you get into a company that your music isn't fitting what they need and what the clients that they serve, you may not see any placements. So there's all of these things that make this complicated. And there's a lot of misconceptions around it. The deal, as you pointed out, being one that people might just immediately run because they don't really understand how that's going to work out in the long run. Because the thing about it is that a single TV placement on God knows what show, like some cooking show or a travel show or, you know, a random sports episode of something, right? Doesn't pay that much. It's a lo pretty fairly low payout a lot of times. But what happens is, is that over years, those things start to add up. And sometimes you get on a show that gets replayed over and over and over again. And then you keep seeing that small little check come in again and again and again. And so it's production music libraries is very much about the long-term view of how your music can make money over the course of many, many years. Not just one big one-off placement. Probably not. Yeah, that can happen still. But that's generally not the strategy of people that are writing for production music libraries. Yes, there's definitely a, an element of quantity. Yes. Just volume yes. of music out there. Yes. In many different libraries. All right. Let's go on to the next kind of category, which is similar in a lot of ways, but different in one big way, which is royalty-free libraries. This has kind of been a, a new trend and have been popping up like crazy, largely to fill a need in the market which was content creators on YouTube, content creators on social media, 
people that are still making content video and still need music to sync to it, but at a much smaller audience size, sometimes or often, than say a TV network. So these royalty-free libraries have cropped up to solve the problem of smaller content creators. Now these placements are often called micro syncs. Pretty self-explanatory because it is a sync, but it's a small one. Dan, I know you've done a fair amount of work with some royalty-free libraries. Yeah, a little bit. I guess I would start by describing it from the, or say more about what you just did about the, the end user's point of view. I mean, if you're a content creator, Let's say a wedding videographer. Good example. That's a classic um, user of a, a royalty-free library. They want to be able to just find a track and pay for it once and use it as much as they want. That's how it works. I don't, the price might be $25, $50, something like that. But it's, it's useful for them that they can, they have that track. Now it's on their hard drive. They can put it in this wedding video and then next client, they can use that same track again. They don't have to worry about relicensing it every time they want to put it in a new video. Because the licensing gets confusing. It exactly. gets very time consuming. So it simplified it for those users. Yeah. However, a lot of these microsyncs, places like YouTube, for instance, don't have any backend royalties. Right. So the business models have changed for royalty-free libraries. And there are different business models across all these libraries. But in general, what they're trying to do is they're setting up their model to be as easy as possible for the end user. And then they pay the artist differently because of that. What are some typical business models for royalty-free libraries? The ones I've seen include the artist simply getting a cut of the, those upfront $25, $50 fees. Those, are, those would be the royalty-free libraries that charge per track. Yep. But some of them are subscription-based. In fact, I think that model is becoming more more prevalent. So the wedding videographer might pay a monthly subscription fee of, I, I don't even know what, and they just have access to all the tracks in the library. And they can use any of them. They can use any of them it as might many cost times them. as they want. Yeah. You know, it might cost them $300 a year. And then now they just have a hard drive full of music that they can use however, however they'd like. Yes. And so how are the writers compensated? I can think of two ways in that model. One is just that some of these royalty-free libraries will just pay up front for your music, say $300, $1,000. But that track is theirs now. You will never see another dime from it. It's in their library. All their subscribers can use it as many times as they want. So that's one way. Another way is they'll do kind of, I guess you would call it like a revenue sharing model where a portion of their monthly subscription fees will go to you, the artist, based on how often your track is downloaded. Sure. Which really says nothing about how often it was used. You just know, how, it's often, just it how often it was downloaded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes they'll, these libraries will promote a track on their homepage and that track will do very well simply because it was, you know, put up front for all their users. But yeah, it doesn't mean your track was ever really even used. It's kind of mysterious like that. Okay. So royalty-free libraries again, like production libraries, have sort of a focus, a main client, which is the micro sync, the YouTube content creator, that kind of thing. But they can serve more than that and, of, and often do. So talk about what happens if somebody's making a commercial that was originally meant for YouTube, but it ends up on TV. Well, what's interesting is that the term royalty free is kind of a misnomer. Exactly. Because if your music ends up on TV, you are still entitled to a um, performance royalty, assuming it wasn't a, a quote buyout deal where, as I said earlier, they just paid you up front for all the rights to your music, then the royalty free library would be entitled to any back end royalties. But if it's not that model and your music ends up on a television show, you should be getting performance royalties through your performing rights organization. Correct. Even though it's a royalty free library, a royalty is owed. Is owed. Yeah. And that royalty, to be clear, isn't paid by the library. It's paid by the end user. So the network has licenses with BMI and ASCAP, and they're the ones who are paying in these fees, and then BMI and ASCAP split it up based on usage. So it's important to understand that there is crossover with royalty-free libraries, and as they grow and become more popular, we may see more and more of those things happening too, where other end users are using it besides just YouTube videographers. 
Yeah, yeah. I I know other composers who are making a lot of money through royalty free libraries because they're licensing their music to like major advertising spots. You know, we're talking like five figure sync fees paid to the artist through a royalty free library. So, as you said, it's it's not there aren't really clear lines. It's important just to understand what the business model is for that royalty free library. Do they share sync fees, for instance? If the sync fee is the is the negotiated price to use your song in the first place, the back end royalties are set by law. And that's just determined by your performing rights organization and the usage and if it gets surveyed and that sort of thing. The sync fee though is negotiable. And the library or the company that is representing your music is doing that negotiating on your behalf. Yes. And they have the the right to do that. That's part of you signing over to them. But they're all going to have different ways of doing that. Some libraries are, again, that 50-50 deal, the production music library, versus others might give you more of the sync fee up front. There's, there's just a lot of variety, and others may, might not give you any of it. That's more in that buyout model. So why would somebody want to write for a royalty-free library? Pros and cons. Pros and cons. Well, I'll tell you, just from personal experience, royalty-free libraries for me have been a place for tracks that didn't work out for my initial intention. So they can also be, you can write for them, you can also kind of give them your throwaway tracks. Uh, you and I have done that. Maybe we wrote like a 30 second piece of music for an advertising spot because we got a custom brief for it, didn't work out. Now we've got this 30 second track, which is pretty good. Maybe somebody else wants it, put it in a royalty free library. And uh, some, some tracks have done well like that. Yeah, royalty free is really about quantity. Yes. Of uses. You would think, I'm getting like a tiny little cut of a subscription or whatever, but you have to understand that there's millions of users of these libraries. Those little tiny micro sinks can really, really add up and to a fair amount of money. Again, it depends on how good your music is. It depends on how good that company is. It depends on a lot of circumstances that are going to be out of your control in a, in a lot of ways, but they can lead to a fairly profitable business plan. <laughs> they can, yeah. I would say my experience with royalty-free libraries is that all the tracks I put in them make at least some money. I haven't tried all the royalty-free libraries, but the ones I have, all my tracks made at least something. And some of them did well, and some of them it, at least it wasn't nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but not much more than nothing. You mean yeah, sometimes, sometimes it, it can is... be very little. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking like less than a dollar a month or something like sure. that. Some common examples of royalty-free libraries are Artlist, Storyblocks, Motion Array, Soundstripe, Audio Jungle, Pond5. There are many. New ones pop up all the time. Yeah. The important thing is to just, obviously, the quality of your music still matters, even though you will find, I would say, some pretty bottom-of-the-barrel stuff in royalty-free libraries, more than maybe the other categories, but... But some of them are getting more and more selective. Exactly. Some of them you can't even get into because they're only taking really, really high-end stuff. That's right. Yeah. Supply of music generally very much outweighs the demand for it, that the placements that can be found for it. And so one thing about the sync industry is that they're not necessarily in need for your music. You know, you're going to need to have very high end music or something that's very niche to have somebody really want your stuff. It's a battle there because it's fairly saturated. Yes. Definitely. Let's go on to the next category that I've roughly broken down. But however, I will say this next category is the most broad, the most overlapping with the other categories. And we, you can kind of fit everybody into this, but it is also a little bit of its own category, which is why I split it off, which I've just roughly called sync agencies, because you'll hear that term a lot. And what does that mean even? Well, ultimately a production music library is still a sync agency and a royalty free library is still a sync agency but they don't use the same terms it's partially because a sync agency likes to differentiate themselves oftentimes from a production music library and from a royalty free library for one they don't want to necessarily use the term library however they still have a catalog of music and it's almost always certainly searchable on their site it's just generally smaller. What makes a company fit into this sync agency category for me, and this is my definition of it, is that they tend to be a little smaller, a little more boutique, highly curated. They're very specific about what they're doing, whether that's a, a quality control thing, 
or a type of music or maybe a type of client. You know, some sync agencies are really focused on ads, marketing agencies, ad agencies, and that's sort of what differentiates them is who their client is. Some sync agencies differentiate themselves based on who they're repping. So they'll only rep like indie bands that are buzzing and trending and really cool. They still might be working with ad agencies and marketing agencies and that sort of thing, but their whole angle, their position is that we're tastemakers and we know what's cool. You can get the next cool thing before anybody else knows who it is, that sort of thing. There's a lot of variety in this category of sync agencies or sync music licensing companies. And some of them are very small and boutique. Some of them are, are quite large and will have ultimately all three of the categories we've talked about so far as offerings. Their main thing might be some very high end type of music or some, some specialization of some sort, but they could also have sort of production music library tracks and royalty free tracks depending on who their client is. For instance, the, uh, one of these companies that I call just a sync agency is like Musicbed. Musicbed, not easy to get into as an artist. Their end client will do everything from a YouTube commercial to a Super Bowl commercial. That's a wide range in type of people that they're serving. And because of that, they have royalty-free music, they have production style music, and then they have an artist roster. So. This is the hardest category to sort of put in a box because it's almost impossible to do that, but it's a very popular type of company. Yeah, I guess sync agent, the agent part of agent, their sync agent would be, they are trying to connect your music with licensors. I mean, that's sync agent. Yeah, the other thing that I would say differentiates this category is that they're generally a little bit more hands-on. Yes. Um, that might be maybe the most important differentiator that I should have started with, but here we are. It, it, it really is a tough one because the production music libraries often have representatives too that will right. hold a client's hand if that client is worth the hand holding, you know, yeah. like a major network or a big ad agency or something like that. But yeah, I think they probably try to position themselves like more, we have higher end artists, we're more boutique and we'll give you better customer service yeah be, we're one-on-one -on -one attention yes unlike where a large amount of the placements that are happening in a production music library or a royalty free library are largely the user going to a database searching and doing it themselves i can go find the music i need because you've set this up it's really tagged well i don't need somebody else helping me do this that still happens at sync agencies of all sizes but but they're often helping to curate. They're working directly with that ad agency or the music supervisor on a show to say, what are your needs? What do you need? Well, we need this type of song. I'm going to go through my catalog myself and I'm going to give you a playlist of 10 of our best tracks that I think will fit this scene. That's what those sync agents are doing yeah. at these companies. Now they exist at all the companies to some extent, as you said, but that's really where their specialty lies or their differentiation lies. Definitely. And sometimes sync agencies, the music is not pre-cleared. And that's part of the service that the sync agent offers. Is right. They can go clear that music because they know all the necessary parties to get approval from. Where I don't think any production music libraries go there. That's pre-cleared. Same with royalty-free libraries. All totally. pre-cleared. That's an important differentiation. I'm glad you brought that up. Because part of what the sync agency might be doing is saying, hey, we've got this band that's like kind of starting to pop off and you might want them for your brand because it'll make you look cool but it was written by a band and maybe the band is signed to an indie label and there's all these parties involved and that music gets harder to clear so skipping ahead a little bit which is if you've done any research in in sync you'll have undoubtedly heard the term music supervisor and a music supervisor is a type of job that exists let's say for a tv show is the person that's deciding what music is being used for this show, setting the mood for, for a movie. And not in the too far along past, there was a time where it was possible for somebody to maybe reach out directly to a music supervisor and say, hey, I think I've got music that fits on this show. Do you want to use it? And that mu music supervisor might say, yeah, great. Let's do this thing. And the music supervisor would clear it. That does not happen very much anymore. It can still happen. If you have a relationship with a music supervisor, that can still happen. But the reason it doesn't happen is because that person that 
talked to the music supervisor and said, yeah, you should use my song. Didn't fully clear it with the other people that might be helped record it or write it or pay for it in some fashion. And it burned that music supervisor ultimately because that song ended up not being cleared. Somebody came out of the woods saying, hey, that's my song. Where's my money? And it became a big problem. That's why these companies exist. They need, the music supervisor doesn't have time to clear all the music they need. They don't want to run around. So the sync agent does that in the meantime. They're doing it sort of beforehand. People that work at these sync licensing companies are sync agents. And when they are talking to an artist or talking to a composer, before they're ever going to put that music on a playlist for a music supervisor, for instance, they're making sure that it's cleared ahead of time or how it would be cleared for that placement. Most of these sync agency companies are still, I would say, pre-clearing it before they even take it on themselves. However, the larger cultural weight you have as an artist, the more popular you get, then the more say you're going to get into what the placement is. So if, if you have your music repped at a sync agency and an oil company wants to use it in their next PR campaign to make them seem like a better company, and they want to use your song, you might get the option to say, no, I don't want to be affiliated with that brand. With a production music library, a royalty-free library, you don't get that option. It's already cleared. It's already in their hands. Or it might not be a values thing like an oil company. It might just be some parties say, that's not enough money, or I don't, we don't want our music being used for that price in that spot. And that generally comes when you're in demand. As exactly. An yeah. So not very common for the, the audience that's listening to this, which would be indie artists, local artists. You can't expect that. Most of the time you just- You've, to... you've made it if you can demand that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> okay, so these companies have also the widest range of definition and the widest range of business models. You will see some of these boutique sync agencies be exclusive, whether they're working with composers or artists or mixture of both, but it's all exclusive. They will only work if- they're the only ones representing that music. That's a common business model. You will also see them as non-exclusive. You will then see a variety of deal structures in this world. On the exclusive side, you can see a variety. You can see 50-50 again. You can see where they might, especially for sort of higher end artists. And what I mean by that is like they're, they're buzzing, they're trending, maybe they're signed to a label, they're, they're on tour. You know, they're clearly, they've got some momentum behind them. There are sync agencies that signed those kind of bands, again, with that promise of like, we can be a tastemaker for your brand. We can connect you to what's cool that you haven't heard of yet. They might offer a better deal where it's maybe only taking 25% of fees and no back end, or, you know, any variety of things. You can see this where that starts to get a lot more favorable for the artist. That's because the artist has weight. They have cultural relevance. If you don't, you generally don't see those deals. You rely on the publisher, on the sync agent to do that work for you. And therefore it's going to take more of the cut. Yeah, I would say that's, that's right. You will often find better deals in the sync agency world, more favorable. Doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make more money. Correct. Um, just because the terms are better, but they exist. And, you, and usually they, I would say you're right. 50, 50 deals are still most common in the sync agency world, but you do see more favorable artist deals, especially if you have more cultural relevancy or you have a fan base, you're an established artist. But this is the world that I would say most bands or artists that are first and foremost trying to push their artist career find themselves working in when they're looking to get into the sync world. This is the world where you'll see non-exclusive deals the most where you might see somebody that really cares about your music versus just an online portal where you submit music to that is going to maybe shop around your, your band and try to find placements for you. But this is also the world where it's, it can be hard to get in to that roster, you know, it, very, very selective. Right. But there's, there is opportunity here and there are a ton of companies in, in this in this realm, but it can just be hard to get into the best companies. Definitely. Another thing to know about these companies is depending on their business model of how this works, sometimes they are just looking for a single song that they think would make, make a good addition to their catalog. Some of them might be only looking for an album's worth, and some of them might be only interested if they can represent your entire catalog. So all of those are differences of what qualifies them of being a good fit for you. Great point. I don't know if we mentioned that 
before, so I'll back up just a little bit, going back to production music libraries, oftentimes they won't sign just one song. Right. They're looking for an entire album. Yeah. Or if they will sign one song, it's part of an album with a theme. Sure. Say indie sports rock or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, the album model is kind of the norm in the production music world where sync agents, they, they might sign a whole album of a band's work mm -hmm. or they might just take one-off songs. Like, I just want your best one or two tracks because I think these are something my clients would be interested in. Yeah. Sync agencies can also have in-house composers. You'll see that a lot of times too, because again, they might be serving clients that sometimes want, we want something trendy and cool and fun. And here's this local artist that's kind of getting buzz and that'd be perfect for this. Sometimes it's like, no, we need something serious and that has like a cello in it. And you know, then it's not really a song anymore. So they need composers for that reason to just make something, which leads to the other thing you'll see a lot in sync agencies, which can be custom briefs where the song is actually the song or the piece, the instrumental is wrote custom to the spot that the client is asking for. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I get emails every day in my inbox from sync agents just like, we need this kind of track, you know, in 24 hours because their client has a very specific need. Maybe it's a song with a specific lyric that they just don't have in their library. So the sync agent sends it to all their artists and composers, it says, does anybody have this or can anybody write this in the next 24 hours? Send it over. You and I have had success and, and not so much success, you know, with different outlets for our music. And when I think about our most successful tracks, our most lucrative partnerships with these companies, I'd say I can think of good examples in, in all three categories. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've had luck with the exclusive 50-50 production music libraries, the more traditional kind. We've had success with royalty-free you know, just kind of throwing some leftovers in there. Mm -hmm. And we've had success with sync agents. So I think it has more to do with, you know, how good is the company? Yep. You know, do they have good outlets for your music? Are they making money? How do you find that out ahead of time? The best way I've found is by knowing somebody else who is writing for them. If they can vouch for a library and you trust that person, then I'd say that's a good outlet, a good partnership for mm -hmm. you to pursue. Yeah. So. I think it has more to do with how strong the company is and who their clients are and how good of a fit your music is. Yes. For, for that company. Yes, absolutely. Which could mean that your music matches their clients' needs. Well, it almost definitely means that, but it could also mean you're filling a, a niche in their library that they don't have yet. Yes. If they've already got a bunch of artists that are doing indie rock, they probably don't need another one in the roster. They've got that need filled. They might need something else. Yeah. On the other hand, if all they do is a specific thing, then they might want to just keep adding more options for that specific thing. You know, a lot of this comes down to doing your homework and figuring out what you want to do, what you have access to, where you think you fit. And I'm hoping that through talking through all of these different types of businesses, what they're looking for, who they work with, it helps you to start framing up where you might fit in or what skills you might need to develop. There is Okay, let's, let's wrap up the sync agency category quick with just a few examples that I grabbed online quick. You've got like the, the OG taxi, you can, you know, paid ones like that. Um, yeah. There's new brand. Which is really more like a pitching service. I mean, they don't even represent your music. I guess not anymore. They're kind of like a middleman in between that where they're just putting you with potential publishers. Exactly. Yeah. Like they might be a middleman between you and a sync agent. Sure. Yeah. But didn't they originally do some of that? I don't know that they were ever okay. signing deals with their clients. Good to know. There are companies that are just sort of your pitching company that you usually are paying to help them get you in front of other people. Yeah, to grow your network. Yep. There's Bank Robber, Music Bed, as I mentioned before, Audio Socket. In town, there's Hit List and In the Groove. There is also Crucial, a company we've worked with a lot. I mean, there's way too many to name. There's they, They're all over the place. Yeah. There's so many. Yeah. In terms of finding these companies, you're going to have to get on the internet and do some research. Where I would personally start is if you use a company like Taxi, that can help grow your network and like, who do they, who are they pitching to, you know, and then you can maybe do some direct pitching. There are companies like that. There's also a lot of creators with podcasts and YouTube channels that teach sync. Learn from them. 
and you will see who they're working with and who they recommend. And that can be a really great way. There are paid communities where you can learn the in, ins and outs of sync, but oftentimes they also give you some sort of access to, to pitch some music as part of that too. And that, that can be a good way to, to start learning more about the companies, but yeah, getting, getting online and, and going on YouTube, you, you'll find a lot of information that way. Yeah. Yeah. With those paid services and communities, I would encourage people to go into it with the mindset of, of learning and growing your network. I've seen a lot of people enter them with the idea, like, I have this music, I'm going to pay this much money and they're going to, you know, make money for me by connecting me with the outlets for my music. And frankly, it often doesn't happen like that. It can, but I think the true value in those sorts of services are the education. You can learn the industry and connecting you with other people, whether that's a music supervisor or a sync agency or a library or collaborators. Yeah, agreed. Okay, I wanna keep talking about how this like where to start thing, but quickly before we get back to that, I wanna talk about a fourth category that I just think is worth mentioning because they're like the big dogs, which is your traditional music publishers. They of course are doing sync, they're just generally repping the largest artists in the world. You know, we're talking about people that rep, you know, Bob Marley's catalog or John Lennon's catalog or something like that, where they're doing million dollar sync deals for movies. Nobody can, you were saying this, like nobody can use that song then for five years because they're going to pay so much for it, you know? Yeah. And they don't want any of their competitors using it. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're not, we're not, we don't really need to spend much time about these libraries because it's generally inaccessible to indie artists. It's not the focus of this episode, but except that often those companies have a sync division for indie artists, which is why it's worth bringing up because what can happen is that this big music publisher has, let's say John Lennon, they get asked by a, a movie, a major motion picture that we want to use John Lennon's song, but they say, no, not enough money <laughs> for it or whatever. Or, you know, cause a lot of, a lot of these indie movies or TV shows, they would like to use popular music. They just can't afford it. And so these big publishers will have an indie division and sync agencies for this reason. This very exact reason exists for this too, is that they're filling in like, well, you can't afford that, but here's what you can have. You can have something that sounds like this, or you can have a cover of this song potentially. And so they will have the big, big publishers will have kind of an indie division to service requests that ultimately don't have the budget for their main artists. They can say, well, but you can have this and this is pretty good, but still their, their indie divisions will be very, very, very good. Yes. And still demand a, usually of a, a pretty good sync fee yeah. for the, the typical indie artist. Who's Often those big publishers, their indie division is just the artists that are still signed to a record label, but aren't, aren't big yet. You know, then they're subbing in those artists for that. And they often do have, these are the kind of artists that do have a fan base and cultural yeah. relevancy, yeah. but they aren't John Lennon. Correct. So that's the other thing, major publishers. So all the, all your major record labels have publishing companies that, that do this. And then you've got you know, other big players like downtown and primary wave. Okay. So those are the categories as, as best I can do. Sorry if it's not perfect. Let's talk about where do you begin if you want to do this thing? I think it starts by asking yourself, do you even want to do this? Is this yeah. something that you want? Cause everybody goes, yeah, I want to get more money for my music. Well, of course, but it's not going to be that easy most of the time. Sometimes maybe your music is very syncable in the sense that it, it carries a very clear mood and a very usable lyric and all of those things that make it versatile to be used in picture. But oftentimes that's not the case. It's not really that usable, not as much as you might think it is or want it to be. Yeah. And I think that's when you were saying with going to paid communities, one of the big things you learn in sync is that, oh yeah, I guess my songs aren't that syncable. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say the step one is be brutally honest with yourself. Is your music right for sync? You were talking about how to get started. And I forget if you mentioned collaborating with somebody who has experience in the sync industry is a great way to do it because one, they can show you the companies that have introduced you to the companies that have worked well for them potentially. 
but also they can be honest with you too. Tell you, do you think these tracks will do well in production music or sync agencies? I find that the longer you spend in the industry, the smaller you realize the target is. Like, yeah, most anything can be synced, but what's likely to do well often fits fits a, a particular mold. It has a very clear emotion, universal lyrics, for example. Hopefully it goes without being said, it has to be well produced, you know, and the instrumental performances have to be good. The vocals have to be high quality. So, so that's step one. I mean, is your music there? And a company like Taxi or, or these other communities could help you determine that. So could a collaborator. You could also just go around pitching your music too, but you know, a lot of these companies aren't even going to take the time to tell you your music isn't good enough. They might not even listen to it. You'll often just never know. <laughs> so, yeah, you can look up a company like that we had mentioned here, like an audio socket music bed bank robber, find when, where to submit something, but you may never get a response. So that's why these communities can be a good thing to pay for ultimately. Or obviously if you know somebody in sync and collaborating and learning from them, that that's a great way to do it. Another thing is you have to ask yourself like, what, what's your output? You know, because if you're, let's say you're in a band and you can make a record every year or two, but it costs you an arm and a leg, like you're not going to sign that record over exclusively. You're going to keep it. You want to promote it. You're trying to tour. You're trying to build your thing. Like more times than not, you're, you're just saying, no, we're going to keep control of this, but we'd like somebody to non-exclusively rep it. So that already just kind of limits you down to like, well, all right, well, then you're only looking for those kind of reps. There's nothing wrong with doing exclusive representation. And in fact, in some ways, it might be a better idea for a lot of people. But you have to ask yourself if that's something you're comfortable with. And then also, I think what makes a lot of people successful in sync, if, the, if you're trying to do sync as a full-time thing, not just on the side, is you have to have a high output. You have to be able to write a lot of music and you need to be able to record and produce it and mix it on your own. You can't pay for somebody to do that all the time. Yeah, you're unlikely to break even if you're paying yeah, someone else to produce it. When I was at my peak, I guess you could say, I was, I mean, I was writing 50, 100, 150 a year. And that's not even on the high end. I mean, I know guys in the 600 plus range of tracks per year. I mean, they just crank out a track or two or three a day. And they're pretty good quality. Yeah. They are, they definitely are not bad. Yeah. Bad won't work. Don't, don't crank out a bunch of bad tracks. I'm not telling anybody to do, to do that, but I'm just saying that's, that's the mentality of a lot of production music composers is quantity over quality. These aren't, you know, your magnum opus, your, your babies. It's, yeah. you're, you're just, cr they're formulaic. You're putting them out there. It's okay to throw 10 tracks in a library. You maybe don't know that isn't really vetted yeah. because it's only 10 of your hundreds of tracks. Yeah. That's the world of a sync composer. The world of a, of an artist that is getting big syncs, that's a different mindset. It's a different exactly. philosophy. And that can be more of the philosophy of simply write the best songs you can and then try to find sync agents that agree that they're good songs. The end. And that's it. It's not quantity over quality it's what's the best song you can possibly write and then try to find somebody to rep it you might find that hard to do depending on the type of music you're writing because a lot of again you got to understand what's actually getting synced like in your mind you might think yeah this would be super cool behind a commercial but if no one is actually doing what you're doing it's unlikely to ever happen you know brands are chasing what's cool so they're trying to copy in a sense you know they're not necessarily looking to be brand new inventive. Yeah, they often aren't pushing the boundaries. Yeah. And that, that's why I said earlier, you know, really listen hard to the music that's being used, whether it's commercials or TV shows. And you'll often find that it is usually, it's not pushing the boundaries. It's usually not very experimental or anything like that. Yeah. It's, it's functional. It's on point. It's modern, relevant. Yeah. So the reason I wanted to have this type of conversation where it, it, kind of goes back and forth between all these sometimes contradicting philosophies and business models and contract agreements and everything is because that's, that's what sync is. You have to understand that. And there's a lot of different end needs and there's a lot of different people writing for it with all different types of talents and skill sets and access and 
connections. And so you have to start by asking yourself where you're at and where your skills are lacking and then try to fill in from there. It's not going to be an easy road. It's going to take time. You have to do a lot of research and you're probably going to need to just dive in at some point, start learning, start putting your music out there, trying to asking for feedback from people that know more than you. Don't be afraid to pay for communities. I think all of that can be really, really helpful. I know Ari's Take has a, a sync academy or some sort of sync course of some sort, sort that I think would be a good place to start too. But I'm sure that there's dozens more. Like I had said before, you know, if you want to go deeper on this, now you head to YouTube and start following people that are teaching sync and pick the teachers that seem like they relate to you or are teaching the kind of music that you make. And then ask yourself what kind of time you have for this how many skills you're going to need to develop and all of that. Don't get me wrong. If you're a band and you've got some songs and a sync agent says, Hey, we want to rep this non-exclusively. You probably don't have anything to lose. You might as well say yes to that. Yeah. If it's non-exclusive and if, if someone can vet that sync agent for you, or you see placements on their website, something like that, I'd say go for it. You made a good point about time. I know performing artists, I mean, time, they're probably trying to pay the bills with a side job while they rehearse with their band and perform and try to write the best music they can. I'm not sure leveraging their time into learning the sync industry is, it might, it might not be for them, you know? And if they get connected with a sync agent because another band they know has had success through that sync agent, I'd say go for it. What do you have to lose? Yeah. If it's non-exclusive, if it has a reversion clause, meaning you can pull out of the deal, you know, after a certain amount of time, I'd say go for it, you know? But the main thing I hope I accomplish with this episode is to just expose you to the variety of situations. Because I think one of the problems that people have when they get into sync or when they're trying to research sync, they look it up, they find a website and that website is telling them what sync is from their perspective. A lot of times it might be a company that does sync and they're t saying that it's instrumental music and it's mood music and stuff because it's a production music library that's explaining what production music is. And then you'll find another website where it's a boutique sync agency that's only representing the best bands in the world. And they're telling you that 50-50 contracts are garbage. And there's so much of you'll, that out you'll there. walk into all these differing opinions of what yeah. is a good sync and what's a bad sync and what's a good sync company and a bad sync company. And it's all biased. It's all very, very biased and it, and it makes understanding the sync world almost impossible. You know, it's taken us years to even have this conversation. Oh yeah. And it's probably not a hundred percent accurate and it's probably not a hundred percent complete. <laughs> no, definitely not a hundred percent complete. I think I said already, I mean, if we cover 80% of it, 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 you're welcome listeners. Cause it took me 10 years to get this 80% of it and it might not be 80% either. There's a lot to know. I, we probably should have said that at the top, that that's hopefully what's unique about this discussion is we don't have any vested interest in trying to persuade you to any model. We've tried them all. Yeah. We've had successes and failures. But when you research sync, you're going to find a lot of companies out there defining sync in a way that is self-serving. They will often make kind of ethical, morally self-righteous claims about why their model is the best and why they're artist friendly and everybody and just vilify everybody else. And we've made money through almost every model. And we've also, you know, had some failures through almost every model. So, you know, this gets said, it's about every industry. It's probably cliche, but it's really about the people and the network and kind of their character and, and their business. Are they, are they doing well? Are they going to treat you well? Are they treating their clients well? And are they treating their artists well? And so, yeah, if somebody else can vet a company for you, that's about as gold as it gets. Agreed. Agreed. And as you are doing your homework and you're learning, just keep in mind that you're probably learning one perspective, yes. not the perspective. So I hope that helps. This conversation's been uh, long enough. I think if we can wrap it up at this point. We've done our best. Dan, thank you for your time. Hey, I thanks definitely for having could me. not have done this without you. And I really appreciate your your, your insight and your knowledge on all of this. Before we wrap it up, is there any last points that we want to try to sneak in that we will regret in half an hour when they come to our mind? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, the editor is going to have his work cut out for him. Sorry, um, Joey. Yeah. And thank you in advance. You're the best. 
No, nothing comes to mind. All right. Yeah, I think I, I've I've done all I can in this thing. But just so you, the listener, know, this is just the first. I've been waiting to have my other sync guests that I sort of have queued up on until we could have this conversation because I do think that this is an episode that people might need to go back to after having listened to one person's perspective. Once we have some other heavy hitters in sync on that can talk about th how they're doing it because it's it's confusing to navigate this whole side of it but but it can be a lot of fun it can be creatively rewarding there's a lot to learn there we'll have episodes in the future ideally on specifically how to write for sync for different types of sync how to deliver things for sync how to pitch to companies those are all big things how to understand the royalties and the splits and make sure your songs are cleared all the business stuff but i feel like a lot of people get to that right away without actually talking about what the industry is. That's why I wanted to have this conversation first. I hope it's been helpful to you. We will continue the conversation in future episodes, so look for those. If you made it this far, you've been dedicated. <laughs> I applaud you. This one was, was a, a lot, but I hope it was helpful. Please reach out if you want to contribute to this conversation. If you're in sync, if you know some things that we don't know, if you feel like we left something out that needs to be brought up in a future episode, reach out. Let's do an episode and, and continue the conversation. We're just trying to help other local musicians understand what this all is. And I'd be happy to, to take any feedback or any suggestions for future episodes. Thank you so much for listening. If you think this would be helpful for somebody else that you know, please share this episode. Please leave a review, like, and subscribe. You know, if people don't end up watching and consuming and liking this podcast, it won't last forever. So if you like it and it was worth it, please say so and share it with somebody else. Thank you so much for listening and for watching. Until next time.